Okay, let's turn in our Bibles this morning to Genesis chapter 3. That's where we're going to start. Now, we're doing a session a um, little bit unique to this overall topic of um, apologetics. We're going to talk about spiritual warfare in apologetics. And this is one of those studies, you know, from the very beginning, this was really on my heart to talk about. Uh, as we were praying about what the different topics were going to be, you know, it dawned on me that a lot of times apologetics is approached from the, from the standpoint, it's just all information, and we don't hear a lot about the spiritual warfare that can take place as we're going about doing ministry with people. Uh, so I'm excited to talk about this, and this is one of those studies, you know, a study like this it, you know, it can either go really, really well, or it can really, really not go well. <laughs> and uh, I'm just kind of hoping that it's one of the ones that has a tendency to go pretty good. Um, scripture tells us that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. So it's one of those things that as we go out to do ministry, right, we have to bear in mind that behind the scenes, there are spiritual forces at work that's influencing what's happening and can even be influencing conversation. And sometimes I think we forget about that. And we're going to, this is kind of a part one, uh, tomorrow is a part two, tomorrow we're going to focus in on the role of the Holy Spirit as we do apologetics. Um, but, you know, we can't, we can't forget, I mean, we even saw it yesterday, just that vivid description from 2 Timothy chapter 2, you know, where it talks about how a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle, able to teach, patient, in humility, correcting those who are in opposition, so that they will know the truth, if God perhaps will grant them repentance, right, coming to their senses and escaping the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. I mean, to me, that is just such a vivid description of the unbeliever and where they're at. They've been taken captive by the enemy. The whole world, 1 John chapter 5 tells us, lies under the sway or the, under the influence of, of the wicked one. There is a spirit at work in the world today. It is the spirit of Antichrist. I think I've observed this certainly as being a pastor for the past 10 years. There are a lot of Christians, a lot of church going Christians who seem obsessed with what Satan is doing in their life. And, and in a lot of ways, almost seem to be able to talk more about the work of the enemy in their life than they can talk about the work of the Lord. You know, I mean, it's like everything's an attack of the enemy, right? They get a cold, and it's an attack of the enemy. Uh, they get a flat tire, it's an attack of the enemy. You know, everything's an attack of the enemy. Instead of just, well, we live in a fallen world, and you got sick, right? Because we do. We get sick. But it's amazing. A lot of times, people will talk about the attack of the enemy, the attack of the enemy, and then you stop and you say, hey, what's the Lord doing in your life? And they almost kind of look at you like, what do you mean? And I do agree that we should be totally more in tune with what the Lord's doing in our life than we should with what the enemy's doing in our life. And so I think that there are two mistakes that we make when it comes to this particular area. The first mistake is we can vastly overestimate the work of Satan. He is a created being. He's a limited being. He can only be in one place at one time. Now, he does have a whole array of demonic beings under his authority. So I think that's where we kind of make the mistake that he's kind of in different places at the same time. He's a limited being. So we can, we can vastly overestimate the work of the enemy in our life. But here's the other mistake. We can vastly underestimate the work of the enemy in our life. Some things are an attack of the enemy. And sometimes they can be so, so subtle that we don't even recognize it. So here's what Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. He says that we're not to be ignorant 
of Satan's devices, lest, he says, he should take advantage of us. So since we don't want to be taken advantage of, we don't want to be ignorant of the devices of Satan. The word ignorant there simply means without knowledge. So this morning we want to talk a little bit about how the enemy might seek to work in our life. Okay, let me begin this morning by just reminding us real quickly of the definition of apologetics. Okay, Def the apologetics has been defined in the following ways. The discipline of defending a position through the systematic use of information or a systematic argumentative discourse. You hear that? A systematic argumentative discourse. A defensive method of argument through the use of reason. Now, with those definitions in mind of what apologetics is, let me just throw something out here. Kind of already dropped this bomb on you yesterday in the middle of our Q&A, but I'll preface what I'm going to talk about today by saying it again. And it's not something that we think of very often. Satan is an apologist. Holding to that definition, a systematic argumentative discourse, defending a position through the use of reason. I'll show you what I mean. We're here in Genesis chapter 3, sort of a classic passage of scripture. You guys are familiar with the context here. The man and the woman, they're in the Garden of Eden. God's put them there. And he says, you know what? Of every tree of the garden, you may freely eat. But there's one tree that's in the midst of the garden. And I don't want you to eat the fruit thereof, because in the day that you do, you will surely die. So the beginning of Genesis chapter 3, watch what happens. It says in verse 1, now the serpent, who we know from other passages in Scripture, this is Satan. Ezekiel chapter 28 tells us that Satan was in the garden in Eden. Revelation chapter 12 and chapter 20 both speak of that serpent of old being Satan. So the serpent, we're told, watch this, was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God has made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said you shall not eat of the tree of the garden of, of sorry, shall you not bleh? You shall not eat of every tree. I'm sure he didn't say it like that. You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. And then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. A couple of things I want you to take note of from this passage. First of all, what takes place in this passage is through a conversation. It's just a conversation. You know, it's amazing, and we'll talk about this probably a little bit more a little bit later, but it's amazing how in a lot of church circles today, um, you, won't, you won't find a lot of Bible teaching going on. Somebody will come up to the front and they'll throw out a question. You know, they'll say something like, well, is it really that big of a deal to believe that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin? Now, here's the thing. That's just a question. That sounds really harmless, doesn't it? It's just a, it's just a simple method of discourse but yeah, you know what? The answer to that question is a very big deal because if Jesus Christ wasn't born of a virgin, then the Bible's not accurate. And if the Bible's not accurate in the fact that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin, then how can the Bible be trusted in any other area? So when somebody just kind of throws out a postulation, isn't that exactly what we see Satan doing here? Now, did God really say? It's just a conversation. We often think of the attack of the enemy as kind of this... Ooh, you know, booga, booga, booga. And like, it's just going to be like really creepy and scary. This is a conversation. It's just a conversation. And the nature of this conversation is one of debate. Satan is offering one position and the woman is coming from another position. Did God really say that? Yes, God did say that. Is that what God meant? And there's a going back and forth, and Satan's using reason. Please notice that. 
He's reasoning with the woman. Now, did God say that? Is that what God said? Is that what God meant? Because, see, I think that what God means is that in the day that you eat of it, you'll be like God. That's a systematic, argumentative discourse through the use of reason. He's reasoning with her. Okay, now turn with me, if you would, to Job chapter 1. Sort of another classic, if we can call it that, passage of scripture, Job chapter 1. To me, just some of the freakiest chapters in the Bible. I mean, I don't know if you ever think about this. I, I, I think that if we're not careful, for those of us who have gone to church for any great length of time or studied the Bible for any great length of time, we, passages like this lose their impact. We're given a glimpse here into the heavenly realm, and we see a conversation taking place between God and Satan. Fascinating to me. Job chapter 1, look down there in verse 6. It says, There was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth on it. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? Now, I want you to just underline that word considered there. We'll talk about it in a few more minutes. The Lord said, Have you considered my servant Job that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? So Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side? You've blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But now, stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. And we know what happens. The Lord gives Satan permission to go and attack Job's family and Job's possessions, right? Then you come to chapter 2, verse 1. It says, again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said to Satan, from where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth on it. And the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and an upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? And still he holds fast to his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him without cause. So Satan answered the Lord and said, skin for skin. Yes, all that a man has he will give for his life, but stretch out your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he'll surely curse you to your face. Once again, can I just point out what might seem like a really obvious fact? This is a conversation. And Satan is presenting a particular position. And you know, although it's kind of fascinating to think about, Satan is trying to reason with God, right? He says, well, surely he's like that. I mean, you've put a hedge around everything he has, but you know what? You take that hedge away and he'll curse you. And then he goes and he attacks him and he comes back and says, well, yeah, you know, I mean, come on. But you let me attack him and he'll curse you. Now, we can't say that he wins the argument, right? Everything that happens in these passages is only because God allows him to be able to do it. But my point is, it's a conversation. And it's one of debate. And Satan is employing the capacity to reason. Come to Matthew chapter 4. This is the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness. Matthew chapter 4. Verse 1, it says, Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Oh, he's going to be tempted by the devil, right? What does that look like? When he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. And now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you're the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But Jesus answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up into the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, Well, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you. 
and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, It is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Again the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. And then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered ministered to him. Okay, I know I sound like a broken record at this point. Please take note that what happens in this passage is a conversation. It's just a conversation. We're just talking here, right? But Satan is presenting a particular position. His position is, if if you're the son of God, his position is, I want you to fall down and worship me. He is trying to convince Jesus of something, and he is using the capacity of reason to do it. Some people overlook the fact that when he says there, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me, that he had the ability to do that. Because at this point in time, the world was still under his dominion. And he had the authority to give that to Jesus. So he's reasoning here. Okay, it's important for us to see that when it comes to this thing of spiritual warfare, I think sometimes we make the mistake of relegating it over here into this category where it has to be purely supernatural, right? Now, there's no question that there are those instances in the Bible where spiritual warfare takes place in a supernatural way. But I got to be honest with you, These instances are just about the most natural thing you can imagine. It's a conversation. It's just two opposing views, employing the capacity for reason, but behind it is Satan. I don't know if you think about this very often, but Satan has an objective when it comes to you and I. Satan has an objective when it comes to the world. He's got a position that he wants to defend. Listen, he's got doctrine that he wants to convince you and I of. Doctrine is not just a Christian thing. Doctrine is teaching. He's got a viewpoint that he wants to convince you of. Remember yesterday? No, it wasn't yesterday. It was on Monday where we talked about how in Romans chapter 1, when, when man suppresses the truth in unrighteousness and then he exchanges the truth of God for the lie. Paul uses the definite article there. In 2 Thessalonians, we talk, it talks about how in the very last days when the Antichrist comes onto the scene, God will send the world strong delusion so that they should believe the lie. Not a lie, but the lie. And we talked about the fact that those references to people believing the lie could be brought all the way back to what we just read in Genesis chapter 3. Because the lie of the enemy from the very beginning was this. You can be like God. And I believe in a lot of ways, this is what the Antichrist will convince people of as he comes onto the scene. You know, make sure you take your theology from the Bible, not Hollywood, right? Hollywood's always putting out this idea of the Antichrist. Antichrist does not mean against Christ. Antichrist means in the place of Christ. And the world will embrace the Antichrist instead of Jesus. And I believe it'll be because... The Antichrist will systematically convince the world, of course we know it's according to the working of Satan, that we don't need God. That you can be God. And you know what? This is exactly what Satan wants to convince people of. There are two basic schools of thought out there. And when you look at everything else, we talked about this yesterday in the Q&A, Either a person believes in Jesus and accepts the work of Jesus Christ on the cross in their place, or they're embracing something else. But all the something else's go against the truth of the gospel. 
no matter how it's packaged, it all has the denial that Jesus Christ was God and he's the Savior that we need to trust in his atoning blood for our salvation. That's behind, that's at the root of everything that Satan wants to convince people of. He, he wants to convince people of the lie that we do not need Jesus. Now, we talk about the fact that Satan is an apologist. He's an apologist in the sense that he has a position, he employs the capacity of reason, and so often, the way that it takes place is it takes place just through a conversation. But here's the other thing. He's also incredibly intelligent. Satan is incredibly intelligent. Did you notice all the way back in Genesis chapter 3? You don't have to turn there, but check it out sometime. It's really revealing the first place something is mentioned in Scripture. Always pay attention to what is said the first time something is mentioned in Scripture. You know, Matthew chapter 16, when the church is first mentioned, we go there when we want to just gain some insight into foundational truths of the church. Jesus says, I will build my church. The gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I mean, those are just foundational. It's Jesus' church. He's building it. The gates of Hades won't prevail against it. It's interesting when both Paul and Jesus teach on marriage, where do they go? They go all the way back to the book of Genesis. They go to the first man, the first woman, because what scripture says there provides us with foundational truths when it comes to marriage. Here's what the Holy Spirit says about Satan the first time he's mentioned in scripture. Here's his introduction. Now, the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field that the Lord God had made. That's his, that's his introduction. The word cunning means crafty or shrewd. It, it means sly and sensible. Again, Ezekiel chapter 28 that tells us that Satan was in the garden of God there it says, full of wisdom and beauty. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 tells us that it was by the craftiness of Satan that the woman was deceived. She was tricked. Guys, the whole nature of a deception is that you don't know it's happening. If you knew it was a deception, then yes, you'd be an idiot. The whole nature of a deception is you don't know you're being deceived. You don't know you're being lied to. I told you to underline that word in the book of Job when the Lord says to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? That word considered is a military term and it means to study. And the Lord says to Satan, have you studied my servant Job? You know why Satan is so effective in his deception against people? Because he's been studying us for literally thousands of years. He's been studying us. He's incredibly intelligent. He's cunning. He's crafty. Very inventive. You know, there's reason to at least entertain the idea that, maybe you've heard this said before, that Satan was some kind of a worship leader, right? From the book of Ezekiel where it talks about, you know, his timbrels and pipes and everything. Something that, excuse me, suggests he was uh, musical in some way, and, and I think there's some legitimacy to that, especially when we consider the creativity behind a lot of secular music nowadays. Again, we're going to come to this in just a little bit, but I guess the thing about it is, is that when you really look at the variety of deceptions there are in the world, it's not like it's just Christianity or one other choice, right? I mean, think about the variety of world religions. You've got Islam, you've got Roman Catholicism, you've got Hinduism, you've got Mormonism. 
you know, you've got all the, 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 the different cults. I mean, think about the apparition, you know, of the Virgin Mary. Think about um, people who claim to have been abducted by aliens. Think about the New Age movement, the use of crystals and, you know, Baha'ism and, and just... There are so many drugs, I mean, alcohol, you, you've got sexual perversity. There are so many different ways that Satan has come up with to deceive man away from the truth that we need Jesus Christ. Highly creative. I mean, Scripture tells us that he even transforms himself into an angel of light. I mean, how much more diabolical can you get in deceiving people than to use somebody's mother? You've got all these people on planet Earth nowadays who think they don't need Jesus, they need Mary. And I can pray to Mary because she's the co-mediatrix. I mean, how diabolical is that? You know, if somebody walked in here and said, hey, I'm Kevin's mother... And Kevin told me to tell you, you don't have to come to class tomorrow. Great, Kevin's mom told me we don't need to come to class. I never told you that. Somebody who claimed to be my mother told you that, but I never told you that. That's diabolical. And it's not happening, you know, get the, get the image of, you know, the red imp, you know, carrying the pitchfork with the bifurcated tail, you know, running around, doing that kind of stuff. That's not, that's not what we see in scriptures. Highly creative. So, when somebody gives you that book and says, hey, have you read this? I thought it was really good. I thought it's got some good ideas in it. Okay, is that a conversation? Is that book appealing? Is it creative? You know how many people I come across who base their theology on movies? You know, they're like, well, it's like that scene in The Passion of the Christ. Well, okay, but The Passion of the Christ is not the Bible. Yeah, but Mel Gibson, he was a Christian. You know, when that movie came out, he was speaking in a lot of different churches, and Christians were showing that movie. But it's not the Bible. Highly creative. No one's doubting the artistic inspiration behind it. The question is, does it present something that contradicts the Bible? Yes. Absolutely. In that movie, you've got a depiction of Satan sort of behind the scenes trying to keep Jesus from going to the cross. The Bible teaches us that Satan was largely responsible for Jesus going to the cross because he thought that in killing Jesus, you have to understand, Satan's a limited being. He did not know that Jesus Christ was going to rise from the dead. And so as he's responsible for seeing God turns the tables. I mean, here's Satan thinking that he's done away with the one who is going to crush his head. Three days later, he comes back to life from the dead. God just turns the tables on him. You've got to love it. But see, right now, some of you are going, what? But that, mo that movie, Satan, he's keeping him. Wait, I don't understand. Where does it say that? What's well, in your Bible? You see what I'm saying? Satan's highly creative. He doesn't show up on the scene and go, <laughs> You will believe. He's not like that snake in the jungle book, right? Ka, look into my eye. He's not that guy. I mean, do you honestly think that's what happened in the garden? Do you think that Satan comes on the scene with Eve and goes, Ooh, Eve, look at the fruit. <laughs> <laughs> Highly creative. Uses the capacity for reason. 
Couldn't find it for you, but if you ever get the chance, you should check out a book called Paralandra by C.S. Lewis. Anybody ever read C.S. Lewis's Space Trilogy? You've read it, okay. You get extra credit, just kidding. Um, there's a fascinating demonstration of this. Paralandra. Sometimes it's, it's uh, titled Voyage to Venus. It's the second book in a three-part series that C.S. Lewis wrote, sometimes called the Space Trilogy. But in this book, this guy takes a voyage to Venus, and up on Venus, there's one woman, and there's a creator. And the creator has placed a prohibition on something. And this guy comes into the world, Paralandra, and there is some absolutely fascinating dialogue that C.S. Lewis authors where he presents this evil man presenting this woman with the choice and the fact that when the creator placed the prohibition on that thing that really he did that because he knew that she would choose to do it and that would show her love for the creator. I mean, it's, it's fascinating, fascinating dialogue. And it's a great glimpse at how Satan sometimes does this in our lives. The screw tape letters is another great work by C.S. Lewis. It's where you see the same sort of thing going on, where the older demon is, is talking to the younger demon and, and instructing the younger demon on how to basically attack the Christian. Just fascinating, fascinating.